Good morning, church. Thanks for watching our live stream. If it's your first time watching us, make sure to connect with us on foothillonline.org. We're going to go into a time of worship, so open up your hearts and get ready.
you enjoyed the time of worship, you can continue to worship by giving on our website at foothillonline.org or text the number down below. We're going to get ready to get into the Word with Pastor Steve. Hey, Foothill family. So good to have you watching us online. We just appreciate you. We want to know, want you to know we're praying for you. We want you to know we care about you. And when you can, we'd love for you to come down and visit us in our in-person services. But it's good to have you here today. Hey, we're in part five of this sermon series called Help is on the Way. And of course, if you've been watching, you know I'm going to ask you this question. But I'd like for you to say it out loud and say it like this. I need help. Go ahead and say that. I need help. We just have a resistance to asking for help. The truth is, Jesus said you would need help and I would need help. And the great news is that Jesus said, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to talk with my father. And he promised when I talk with him that he would send a helper. And that helper would be the Holy Spirit. And that's the promise Jesus made to you and to me. And then the question really is today, as it has been throughout this series, are you willing to get Holy Spirit help? Are you willing, if you will, to surrender your power for his power? Right? I mean, we all know it's really, really true that there are moments in our life when it comes to finances or relationships or emotional challenges. Maybe it's a, a habit, um, an addiction, a hurt that we can't get over. There, these areas all contain within them an, an element where we just can't seem to fix it by ourselves. And Jesus knew that, and he gave us the Holy Spirit to help us with that. So today we're going to look at part five of Help is on the Way. We've titled that because that's the phrase that Jesus used. I'm sending you help, the Holy Spirit, and that was on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is, is asking, will you let me help? That's really what this whole series is about, is the Holy Spirit is asking, will you let me help? And then it's been my hope and, and dream that throughout this series that you would commit to cultivating a more intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. And in doing that, you're going to start experiencing so much help from him. So, hey, listen, today what we're going to try to do is clarify the confusion regarding the Holy Spirit. There, are so, there is so much confusion many times in believers and unbelievers about the Holy Spirit. There are so many questions, common questions, and sometimes there's not a good answer or many believers haven't receive the right answer. And because of that, there's so much confusion around the Holy Spirit that many believers just kind of stand off or stay away from the Holy Spirit. I'm hoping today that we can clarify all the confusion, that you can realize how important Jesus felt uh, that you get Holy Spirit help and that you move in that direction. And by clarifying the confusion that you may have heard in church and all these other places, using God's word, that you'll feel more comfortable pursuing a everyday conscious communion or relationship and communication with the Holy Spirit. So, so let's get started. Uh, many times believers have questions and are confused about receiving the promise of help, which is the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. Today, I, I want to take a look at the most common questions asked about the Holy Spirit, and hopefully I can bring some clarification to all the confusion and uh, so many different experiences out there that I've heard um, or confusion that I've heard. People have had an experience or seen an experience and walked away with the wrong understanding. Uh, again, it's our sincere hope that you, you, you uh, cultivate a close relationship with the Holy Spirit. So, so let's get started today. Let's see if we can clarify the confusion. I'm going to go over seven questions that I hope help. If uh, you have an additional question, to the ones I'll be answering today, I'd love for you to email it 
to us on just go to our website foothillonline.org and send in your question and I'll do my best to see if I can answer that for you let's look at question number one question number one reads like this did I really receive the Holy Spirit when I was born again and the answer is yes many times a believer will say well why should I be baptized in the Holy Spirit didn't I receive the Holy Spirit at salvation And the answer is yes, you did receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. The Holy Spirit is also referred to, (laughs) referred as uh, the spirit of sonship who enters each person when he or she is born again. The spirit brings the inner witness and assurance that a person is a child of God. So here's what we know. We're going to look at Romans chapter 8. Here's what we know. At salvation, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into sonship. Uh, When you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes and he convinces you and convicts you of the sin that's in your life. And when he convicts you of your sin, he convinces you that you need a Savior. And it's at that moment when you repent and you say, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Uh, It's in that moment when you pray the sinner's prayer that you're born again. The Holy Spirit has baptized you into the family of God. Your spirit, which was dead, now comes alive. And that's where we get that phrase, you're born again. Your spirit is born again. And the Holy Spirit, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit now reside inside of you. And we get that answer from Romans chapter 8. Verse 15 and 16. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received, that's the Holy Spirit, brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So when we read this verse, we recognize that the Holy Spirit is the one that that helps. When I confess my sins to the Father, the Holy Spirit is one that testifies and convinces me on the inside that I truly am a child of God. What I love about this passage says you're you're no longer a slave. You see, be, before then, I, I had to try to live according to the Ten Commandments. I don't know if you're like me, but I've been unable to keep all those. I mean, one of them is thou shalt not lie. How many of us are guilty of that one? All of us. How many sins does it take to keep us out of heaven? One. See, we're, we're just all in trouble. We're, we're, we're a slave to all these rules, and we just can't make it work. And then the Holy Spirit comes and says, Jesus Christ has paid the penalties for all your, your sins. You're going to be adopted, and you're going to be a son You're going to have the privilege and you're going to have the position of being a child of God. You're no longer a slave to trying to earn your way to heaven, which would never work and is impossible. And now you are a child of God and you have the Holy Spirit's help to help you become and be the person God's called you to be. You know, a lot of times when we talk about moving from this step of salvation, this is a salvation baptism, um, we think, well, I don't, you know, what do I need to do after that? And the truth is, if you listen to last week's sermon, there is a pattern throughout the New Testament, and it, there was a salvation baptism, there was a water baptism where your your body is baptized in water, and then there is a third baptism, the Holy Spirit uh, baptism, and the baptizer is Jesus. Jesus says, "I will baptize you in the Holy Spirit." And so there's these three baptisms, and those are the patterns. But when we ask this question, um, when I got saved, do I have the Holy Spirit in me? Yes, the Holy Spirit's in me, and he has convinced me and convicted me of my sin. But Jesus says, you need to have another experience. You need to be water baptized, and you need to, to ha- be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I will baptize you. In the Holy Spirit. And we're going to unpackage that and unpack that in our, our next few questions. But here's what, here maybe is a great example, because with this question comes this, 
this analogy. I hear this one all the time. Well, Pastor Steve, uh, I do know there was a criminal hanging on the cross with Jesus. And while they were there, uh, they were sitting there and uh, one of the criminals was mean and angry. And the other one actually looked at Jesus while he's hanging on the cross and said, would you remember me this day in heaven? Would you remember me in paradise? And here's the truth. Jesus looks at him and says, yes, today I will see you in paradise. And here's the point, that he became a believer. He believed in Jesus Christ while on the cross, looking at Jesus the way he was responding to his offenders, the way that he was talking. He understood and believed him to be the true Messiah. And at that moment, he received salvation, and Jesus said, you'll be with me this day in heaven. Here's what this passage doesn't say, but what I believe, and I can show that to you in Scripture. Had that criminal got down from the cross, let's just imagine that somehow somebody ran up and his, his crimes were expunged. And the guards led him down from the cross. If he was walking away from the cross, Jesus was, would have said, I still want to see you in paradise. And you're a believer and you're a child of God. But if you're going to stay on, here on earth any longer, then here's what you need to do. Need to do. Go get water baptized and then receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus would have said. The, the only reason, you know, these water baptism... And the Holy Spirit baptism isn't necessarily, uh, it won't keep you from going to heaven if you don't have that. But here's the point. Jesus knew he was going straight to heaven that day within a couple hours. He wasn't going to need help here on earth. But you and I, we need help here on earth. And Jesus said, there's two more steps that I want you to take. I want you to be water baptized. That simply means Jesus is saying, I want you to openly, publicly declare you're a child of God, that you're going to repent. You're going to stop doing the carnal way of living and start, turn around, repent, start living a life in Christian living and be the person that God created you to be. So Jesus expects us to not only get water baptized, but to continue what baptism, water baptism is all about. And that's declaring that I'm a child of God. I'm not a perfect one. I got a lot of issues, but I am living a Christian life now and no longer living a carnal life. And to the best of my ability, with the Holy Spirit's help, I'm moving that direction. And then in addition to that, as I make that public declaration with my words, with my body, trying to do the right thing, I'm going to need help. And Jesus told this to the disciples. You see, the disciples, John was at the cross, and he told John, listen, I know this guy, this criminal is going to heaven with me, but you, you're going to need to go get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about that for the last couple of weeks. And so when we look at question number one, yes, the Holy Spirit is in you, but when Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, he's going to give you power power to be his witness, power to witness to other people, to proclaim Jesus Christ. He's going to give you a, uh, a prayer language. He's going to uh, teach you how to speak in an unknown tongue, a pure language, a prayer language between you and the Heavenly Father. And so that answers question number one. Let's go to question number two. Why, why do we need to experience uh, spirit baptism if we already have the Holy Spirit. And, and I've kind of answered that, but, but I want to ask that question and answer it. Why do we need to experience spirit baptism if we already have the Holy Spirit in us? Now, although um, uh, when we look at the disciples and we look at the time period, we look in John chapter 20, 22. We're not going to go there. But in John 20, 22, uh, Jesus dies. He, he rose from the dead on the third day. And he spends 40 days showing himself to the disciples. So now he has, he has died. And there's this passage in John 20, 22, where Jesus says, he goes to the disciples and he's talking to them. And he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now you've got to remember that, that at salvation, you and I receive the Holy Spirit. 
But the disciples had been with Jesus. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. They had Jesus with them. Now, there were times where the Holy Spirit came upon them and Jesus sent the Holy Spirit with them to do stuff in ministry and they did some powerful things. But up until this point, the Holy Spirit wasn't in them. And Jesus breathes on, on the disciples. Now, remember, this is the 40 days after Jesus has rose from the dead. He's showing himself to the disciples. And then at the end of the 40 days, he's going to say, wait 10 more days and on Pentecost, I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. But right in the middle of all this, these 40 days, he breathes on the, on the disciples. And he says, now that I'm not here, I'm roaming around and I have a glorified body. And I've been raised from the dead. But now that I'm not here with you, I want the Holy Spirit to be in you. And he breathes on them. So if they had the Holy Spirit in them, the disciples, at that moment, and yet Jesus continued to say, you still need to go get baptized in the Holy Spirit, then that pattern is a pattern that you and I must pursue also. So it, it reminds us, yes, I have the Holy Spirit in me, just like the disciples, but just as the disciples were encouraged by Jesus and told by Jesus, go and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a few days, you and I must do the same thing. So let's look at John 14. We're going to look at verse 15 and 17. The Bible says, um, again, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper or an advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So, so Jesus says, I want to give you this promise. You need this help. You need the Holy Spirit's help. Let's look at uh, question number three. Well, why did God think, or why did God link speaking in a new language to being filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, there may be many reasons for this. I'm just going to try to help you with at least four or five possible reasons why there's this this new language, this speaking in tongues language that is linked to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at uh, possible reason number one. The purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to become a witness for Jesus to the ends of the earth. Those speaking in a new language is a sign that a believer will have a part in the global witnessing. So, so when I read that answer, the answer was the disciples were going to start the Christian church. This was when Jesus went to heaven and then he baptized them in the Holy Spirit. It gave them power to be a witness, to communicate God's word, to be the person God created them to be to talk to other people about coming to salvation. And then they begin to build churches in different communities. And the Christian church was birthed. Well, that would have been impossible for 12 disciples all by themselves with no Holy Spirit power. They, in order to be a witness, to be somebody to go and proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ, we need his strength and power to do that, or it just won't be effective. And so when we talk about um, speaking in tongues, um, it was a sign that, that when we speak in tongues, it went to all nations. This is the first time in history where everybody knew the Jews were God's holy chosen people. This was a moment in history prophesied by Joel that the power of the Holy Spirit would fall on all on all men and women, and it would go beyond the Jews to every different um, cultural group. And it was a moment, this speaking in another language was God saying, I'm going to speak to the entire world, to all languages. I'm bringing the good news of the gospel. And, and if you and I want the Holy Spirit to help us personally and help us to be a witness for God, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when we look at Acts chapter 1 and 8, here's what it says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And so when this Holy Spirit power comes on you, what will happen? You will be my witness. Now here it is. Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, 
and the ends of the earth. This power helped them to become great witnesses and helps you and I to become great witnesses. I mean, you know, Jesus summed up the whole Bible in saying, you must love the Lord with all your heart and with all your might, with all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. The only way that I can do both of those things, which sum up all the Ten Commandments, is if I have Holy Spirit power. I, I need to love the Lord, and I need to be blessed by the Lord, but I need to love my neighbor. I need to be a witness to my neighbor. God calls and commands us to do that. If you're going to do that powerfully, you need the Holy Spirit's help. Let's look at another possible uh, answer for this question. The, the tongue is the most uh, rebellious member of our body. Would you, would you agree with me there? Have you ever said any, something you wish you'd never said? Have you ever spoke something and as the words are coming out of your mouth, you're going, no. You just wish you could pull them back in because you're just thinking, man, why did I say that? You know, I mean, it's, it, it is... Uh, one of the most difficult things, if not impossible, to tame. And that's what it says in the book of James. So James, who is the stepbrother to Jesus, I'm sure he used some words he shouldn't have. When he wrote this book, he had to be thinking, when I was growing up with Jesus, I said some really stupid stuff. And now that I know he's the Messiah, I'm feeling a little shame and regret for all that. But look what James writes in in James 3, let's look at verse 6 and 8. The tongue is also uh, the tongue is also also is a fire. The world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. That's some pretty powerful language, huh? Look at verse 7. All kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Man, when you read that verse, you're just thinking, maybe I should just stop talking, right? But, but, but here's the truth. You know that verse is true. Uh, isn't it interesting that I know inevitably my tongue is going to go off uh, schedule. It's going to go off the charts. It's going to start a fire and burn a relationship and mess up everything. The truth is, is I know I'm headed in that direction, and I know I can't control it, and I know I need help with my tongue. And then, then if I ask myself the question, how in the world could I possibly talk to somebody else about Jesus when my own tongue is out of control. And then that's where Jesus says, you're right. You need help. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. When we talk about him linking tongues to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when we receive the helper, the Holy Spirit, we're saturated. So the Holy Spirit is already inside of us. When we're baptized in the Spirit, he's not only inside of us, he fills us up. And he pours himself on us. So we're completely saturated with Holy Spirit power and help. That's the difference between having the Holy Spirit in you and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Is that the Holy Spirit is filling you, continually filling you, giving you help and power to live the life that you're called to live. And, and then he comes upon you in great moments to help you do things like pray for healing and see people healed when you can't do it by yourself. But if in obedience you pray for somebody, the Holy Spirit through you can heal them. So, so allowing the Holy Spirit to control the tongue may indicate complete surrender, right? It's the only time that my tongue is tamed is when I say, Holy Spirit, I'm only going to say whatever you want me to say. As a matter of fact, that if you've been listening to our sermon series, when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's this moment where you speak in a heavenly language. There's a moment where the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to give you sounds and syllables, and it's the language of heaven, and I'm going to ask you to make the choice to repeat those with your mouth. You're going to repeat the words that I give you. 
You're not going to know what they mean. Literally, Paul says, it's going to bypass my intellect and my wisdom, and it's just going to be a sound and syllable that the Holy Spirit asks me to repeat. And then I have the choice or not to choose to repeat it. But if I choose to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I begin to choose to speak out those sounds and those syllables. Now, in that moment, if I'm saying the exact words the Holy Spirit asks me to say, to say, isn't that now a pure language? Isn't it now my tongue is tamed only in that I'm completely surrendered into only saying what the Holy Spirit asked me to say? And in that moment, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is, is helping me to pray and communicate to God in a language far superior than my English language. If you've ever been in a moment where you couldn't put words to your emotions, but you wanted to pray and ask God for help, but you didn't have the words to ask for help. The Holy Spirit, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, I will give you the words to pray. And then you pray those words, and God helps you supernaturally. So, so let's look at uh, another possible reason why God links this speaking in tongues um, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in a new language reminds us of this great truth. We cannot do anything for God without help. As often as believers speak in new tongues, they remember to, be, to depend upon the invisible God. Speaking in tongues reminds us that we do not succeed by might or power, but only by God's Spirit. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says that uh, in Zechariah. It says, this is Zechariah 4, 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. In that moment, uh, the Lord is saying, you are not going to win this in and of your own strength. The battle before you will only be won by the Holy Spirit. There are moments in our life that that every time I begin to pray my prayer language and speaking in tongues, I'm reminded I'm completely dependent on God. There are areas of my life that I can't muscle up and overcome. My strength and my power won't do it. Only God's Spirit can help me with this kind of problem. And so I believe that's a, another answer for why God links tongues to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, lastly, it says this, uh, uh, the last answer here says, speaking in a new language is a new form of praying. He who speaks in a tongue speaks to God. Now, when I speak in tongues, I'm not speaking to people. That's why I, I'm not doing that in a church with a microphone in my mouth, because I'm speaking to God, and if I speak to them, or if I'm speaking to God while they're in my presence, um, it's, in many ways, it's a little bit rude. I am uh, speaking to God, and I'm having a conversation with Him, and that's a moment where I need to do it by myself. So when I do get on stage and I'm preaching to the church, I, I have what the Lord has told me to say, and then I speak to you. Now, it, it's so very clear. A lot of times people think speaking in tongues is used to preach to other people, but, but look at verse, 1 Corinthians 14.2. There's no mistake in this verse, 1 Corinthians 14.2. For anyone, Paul is writing, he says, for anyone who speaks in tongues, look at me, does not speak to people, but to God. That, that's what it says. It's just as clear as can be. Indeed, no one understands them. If I were to pray in tongues, you wouldn't understand a word I'm saying. In many ways, I'd be wasting your time. It says, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. So it, it's, a, it's a communication for me and God. It's a communication that surrenders. I surrender to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, help me talk like this. He says, well, here, say this. And then I have a choice. and I go, okay, I'm going to say it. So I say those, those heavenly words, and I talk to God in a way I couldn't possibly do in my English language. So he helps me with praying, okay? And a lot of times you hear the word spoken tongues, my prayer language. Um, those are the kind of phrases you'll hear. And that's what we're referring to right here. Now look at 1 Corinthians 14, 14. Paul is talking. He says, for if I pray in tongues, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. 
Again, Paul is saying, I have to say these sounds and syllables. It's humbling because I don't know what I'm saying, but I'm trusting the Holy Spirit because he gave me the words. And it's bypassing my intellect and my, my knowledge, and I'm just trusting the Holy Spirit to give me the words to say to my Heavenly Father that will help me and build me up and empower me to be the person he's created me to be. All right, let's look at question uh, number four. Our spiritual, uh, our spiritual things like healing and miracles, speaking in a new language for today. Now, there's a, we're not going to go there, but in 1 Corinthians 13, um, there is this passage there that says, there is a day where these things will cease and they will come to an end. Some people uh, have confused that verse to believe that, that it ended with the apostles and it doesn't continue. But this, this chapter, verse 13, is very clear. It's saying that these will end when Jesus returns, when Jesus returns. So how long do we need these spiritual gifts? We need them until Jesus returns. That, that passage is saying someday Jesus will come and take the saints and we'll be raptured and we'll be with him. And no longer will there be a need for these things because we're now with them. And so, so we, we looked last week that the pattern went through 30 plus years throughout the New Testament to Paul and all the churches, this pattern of speaking in tongues, and it has continued to the present day and will continue until Jesus' return. Uh, let's look at question number five. Does God give each believer a new language when he or she is filled with the Spirit? Or does God give different spiritual gifts to each believer? Now I'm going to see if I can... There is some confusion here. I'm going to see if I can help you. The answer is yes on the first question. God gives every one of us a new prayer language of speaking in tongues. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you want help praying and you want the Holy Spirit to help you and you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you want His prayer language, you just simply have to say, this is a gift. The Bible says it's a gift. You have to say, Holy Spirit, help me do this and then begin to practice it. So then everybody gets that that prayer language. Where the confusion comes is, is on the other hand, God does give different gifts uh, to believers. So there's another passage that says, uh, some he gave the gift to teach, to prophesy, to heal. And in that listing of gifts, there's one gift called tongues and interpretation. Tongues and interpretation is different than speaking in tongues in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's different in this way. Speaking in tongues with interpretation, they're connected together, is a moment in a church service where there is somebody who speaks in tongues and then it's interpreted and the interpretation is a, a, a speaking from God to everybody in the building to build up the church. Okay? So there are only a few people that that they get that kind of gift. But that's not to be confused with this prayer language. Remember this. In, in, uh, when we, in our previous sermon series, in the, I think it was in part two, the Holy Spirit came on 120 disciples, not just the 12 at, at the day of Pentecost. Every individual spoke in tongues. Every individual spoke in their prayer language to heaven. And if you remember clearly, everybody that was watching from a distance seen them talking to God, not to them, talking to God and giving praises to God. And so the prayer language is for everybody. Now when it comes to the gifts of miracles and healing and prayer and administration and the gift of tongues and interpretation. Not everybody gets all those gifts. God gives us some of those gifts. I have some and you have some, but we don't have all of them. But when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the prayer language of speaking in tongues, it's for absolutely everybody. If we look at Acts chapter 2, verse 4, uh, again, all of them, 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. And as we go throughout the entire book of Acts, they got baptized and spoke in tongues in chapter 8, 9, and 19. Let's go with uh, question number six. 
Will God embarrass me by causing me to speak in a new language in public? And the answer is no. The Holy Spirit enables you to speak in a new language, but he never forces you to speak in a new language. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. God guides the believer. The Holy Spirit guides us in speaking in a new language. But, listen to me, but the believer will never be embarrassed by speaking in tongues. The, the truth is, is, you have, the Holy Spirit can give me the words to say, and I can choose to say them. I can choose not to say them. I can choose to say them later on. I'm in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't take over me. He doesn't take over my tongue. He, he simply says, here are some words I'd like you to say. And then I choose to say it. I can say them in my heart. I can say them at home. I can, if I'm comfortable in a church setting where uh, we're at an altar and it's a bunch of just believers there and it wouldn't cause confusion with unbelievers, we can pray in tongues and I may feel comfortable and I'm not embarrassed there. But the truth is God will never uh, embarrass you in speaking in tongues. Last question, um, how can one be sure the new language is from God or from Satan or the flesh? Uh, that's, that's a question I, I hear quite often. Um, I, I think we just, the mystery of it all, not knowing what I'm saying, here's what it requires. It forces you to trust the Holy Spirit. It forces you to have faith. It forces you to say, boy, I have no idea what I'm saying, but Holy Spirit, if you'll tell me, now I'm not going to dream up stuff, but I'm praying, I'm a child of God, I've asked God to forgive me of all my sins, and I say, Holy Spirit, would you help me now pray to God? And he says, yes, and I'm walking through these steps as I'm in my prayer time, and the Holy Spirit says, here, I want you to say this then you should say it. You should trust the Holy Spirit. Is, is God at that moment going to let Satan start taking over you or making you say, say satanic words? No, no. If you're a child of God and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I mean, what happened in the upper room on the day of Pentecost? 120 of them were there. The Holy Spirit comes down. And the Holy Spirit says, I want to baptize you guys. And they say, yes, we've been waiting for it. Jesus told us to wait here. So what does that look like? And the Holy Spirit says, well, here's what we're going to do. I want you to say this. And they had the choice. And they chose to just repeat the words of the Holy Spirit and begin to say them. And it's really that simple. And, and, and if I look at Luke 11, 11 through 13, here, here's what you have to know. Would Jesus or God ever lie to you? Would they try to trick you? Would they try to lead you into an area that could go really, really bad and you'd be doing satanic stuff instead of heavenly stuff? And you know the answer. The answer is no. They would never, ever lead you in that direction. Well, look what verse 11 says in Luke 11. Which of your fathers, of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil men, know how to give good gifts to your children, listen to this phrase, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him? I mean, God is telling you, I want you to have the Holy Spirit. I not only want him to be in you at salvation, but I want you to cultivate a relationship with him, and I want you to be filled over and over again with the Holy Spirit. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is being filled over and over. The Holy Spirit, I have this constant communication with him. I'm communicating, asking for his help for daily living. And he's talking to me and I'm listening and I'm asking questions. And I'm being filled. 
And the Holy Spirit comes upon me in moments, and He lives in me, and I'm completely saturated with His help. Now, God says, I want you to have it. Jesus said, when I die and go to heaven, uh, I, will, I promise you that the Father uh, will, uh, I will ask the Father, and He will allow me to baptize you, because Jesus does the, the baptizing. I will baptize you in this Holy Spirit help, and it'll be amazing life. So listen. There really should be nothing to fear when it comes to baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you love him and you want a Holy Spirit help, you want the promise that Jesus promised for you. Jesus said, I would not wish you to be down here alone by yourself. I want you to have the Holy Spirit help. So I'm sending him to you, but you must receive him. Will that be you today? If that's you, I I challenge you to go on a journey to read through the book of Acts and uh, get alone with God. Get alone and say, Holy Spirit, um, I want to be baptized. Jesus, right now, I want you to baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And then as you get baptized and you receive that gift and you now have it, you say, Holy Spirit, you teach me how to pray in a heavenly language. And then the Holy Spirit will bring to your attention these sounds and syllables. That's the way you'll understand them. And he'll say, go ahead and repeat these. And it's a language that just doesn't happen fluently. That's a myth. Immediately. It's like any other language. You'll begin to grow in it. And he'll begin to give you new words. And you'll learn how to grow in speaking in tongues and grow in your prayer language and your communication with God. So I I hope these these questions and these answers help with the confusion. I hope the fear is removed, and I'm hoping that you can move forward in getting help here on earth because you and I both know we need a lot of help here on earth. There's just too many God-sized problems in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Hey, let let me pray with you before we go. Uh, Lord, we we love you so much. Um, We're so grateful that in the book of Acts you've laid out such a clear pattern that that the Holy Spirit is the one that baptizes me into salvation it's a salvation baptism and I'm convinced that I'm a sinner and as I ask for forgiveness the Holy Spirit removes all condemnation I feel free now I feel like a child of God and I I don't feel the weight and shame of sin anymore. And and then I I move towards a discipleship baptism, a water baptism where any disciple can baptize me. But it's where I make a public declaration. I baptize, I water baptize my body. I put it under water and uh, the disciple brings me back up. I make a public declaration that that I, I no longer am going to live the way I used to, which is a life of carnality. But I'm now going to repent and not live that way anymore and move in the direction of living like Christ. But it doesn't stop there. The book of Acts, Lord, says that, that many received the promise that Jesus gave to his disciples and to all of us. They received the promise of a Holy Spirit baptism, which empowered the 12 disciples to birth the Christian church. Lord, we need that power to to be your witness, to be powerful believers in Jesus Christ, to carry out your calling. And one of the great benefits to that is that what comes along with this is I get a personal prayer language that allows me to communicate to you in an intimate way. And for all those who are watching online that are sitting there with their heads bowed and want this gift, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, as you did in the book of Acts on 120 disciples, I pray you baptize them right now, right where they're at in their living room. I pray you you come upon them, you fill them from the inside out, you saturate them with your... You, uh, Holy Spirit, you saturate them and you give them that prayer language. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. Hey, God bless you. If that's you and you've been in this series and you've gotten baptized in the Holy Spirit, we'd love for you again to go online, foothillonline.org. Let us know that you got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And hey, hey, God bless you. The best is yet to come. God bless you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Make sure to connect with us online and feel free to share this live stream on your Facebook page and we'll see you next week.